Every 20 seconds, someone in the United States has a heart attack. There's so much pressure in my chest. That's one and a half million people every year. A third of them will die. I'm Kat Carney. Join me as we venture into the heart and discover the cause of heart attack, America's number one killer. This woman is experiencing chest pain. She's also feeling lightheaded and has pain in her neck and jaw. These are classic symptoms of heart attack. When did the chest pain start? To make an accurate diagnosis, Dr. Octavio Diaz needs to obtain as much information as quickly as he can because every second counts. You're still having chest pain and your EKG shows that you're having a heart attack. The heart's function is to pump nutrient-rich, oxygenated blood to the entire body, including the heart muscle itself, through these coronary arteries. This is where heart attack begins. If these arteries become blocked, the heart continues to beat, but the area downstream of the blockage begins to die. The death of the heart muscle is called myocardial infarction, or heart attack. Symptoms of heart attack include persistent chest pain or pressure, chest pain accompanied by shortness of breath, sweating, or nausea, or pain that radiates into the shoulders, neck, jaw, or arms, especially the left arm. Incredibly, nearly 50% of heart attack victims fail to recognize or even deny these symptoms, and most wait two or more hours before getting help. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for patients that are sitting at home with chest pain to recognize the signs and symptoms and to call 911 or get to the nearest emergency department as quickly as possible. The bottom line, seek help quickly because heart attack can kill. Heart disease, often a precursor to heart attack, afflicts 60 million Americans and kills more than 2,600 people each day. That's more than the deaths from cancer, stroke, and lung disease combined. The main cause of heart disease is hardening of the arteries, or atherosclerosis. So what is atherosclerosis? Well, let's say that these pipes are arteries in your body. This one is clean as a whistle. That's what a healthy artery looks like. But the inside wall of this pipe is covered with rust and sludge. That's atherosclerosis. The garbage on the inside of this pipe is like the fat, cholesterol, cell debris, and calcium that build up on the inside of your arteries, causing them to narrow, making it more difficult for blood to flow increasing your chances of heart attack. I'm visiting Dr. Marsha Cohen to take a look at the inside of real arteries. Marsha, what does atherosclerosis look like in the body? Well, Kat, let me first show you what a normal artery looks like that doesn't have any atherosclerosis, and then I'll show you one with atherosclerosis, and you will be impressed. Okay. Here is a normal artery, and a normal artery, the wall is made out of muscle, and as you can see, there's nothing inside the artery, and that's because there's no atherosclerosis. This artery is completely normal, and blood can flow right through with no problem. But when you have somebody who has atherosclerosis. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you can see the difference. We have a little narrow rim left of the blood vessel, but the entire inside of the blood vessel is filled with cholesterol. 
Cholesterol is a fat-like substance carried through the blood by either of two types of complex molecules called lipoproteins. High-density lipoproteins, or HDLs, are known as the good cholesterol carriers. They're believed to attach firmly to cholesterol and carry it out of the body. Low-density lipoproteins, or LDLs, are known as bad cholesterol carriers because they don't bind well to cholesterol and leave much of it behind in the bloodstream. This dropped cholesterol then attaches to the inside walls of the arteries. If enough builds up, it can close the artery off completely. And unfortunately for this individual, on top of the cholesterol, is a blood clot. He has severe atherosclerosis with a recent blood clot totally blocking his artery. And as you see, when I move everything around, there is no opening. There is no other place for blood to flow through. And so this person had a heart attack. If this person's clot occurred in the brain, he would have suffered a stroke. Well, now, his artery is completely blocked, but when did he start to feel symptoms? The sad part of all this is, is that you have to have almost 90% narrowing of your artery before you become symptomatic. So, you know, you can be this healthy man who thinks everything is perfectly fine, but maybe you have a little bit of high cholesterol and maybe your blood pressure is up and you get on a treadmill and whammo, you have a heart attack. Heart disease can be a family affair. If an immediate family member has had a heart attack, your chances of suffering one increases 50%. 41-year-old Ron Rukino knows how tragic life can be in a family with a history of heart attack. When I was uh, 16, uh, my father uh, died, of a, died of a heart attack. I still remember my mother waking me up in the morning to tell me. And my father was dead. At the time, he was 45. My goodness, he was, he was very young. Heart disease is hereditary and Ron's family history was catching up with him. For 12 years, he suffered chest discomfort, but chalked it up to being out of shape. Then in 1994, on Father's Day, Ron's older brother Rick collapsed and died of a massive heart attack. Only then did Ron start to take his own chest discomfort seriously. It took that to wake me up that I could be next or the problems that I was having were related to my heart. It almost took out the, all the male members of my family. It's scary to think of that. You shouldn't get away from us, huh? Ron's doctors discovered that his cholesterol levels were dangerously high hovering above 340 with almost no good cholesterol carriers. To confirm Ron's risk, they injected dye into his bloodstream. Then, using a special x-ray technique called angiogram, they watched the dye flow through his heart, looking for any blockages. He had a cardiac catheterization, which amazingly showed complete occlusion of the right coronary artery and tight narrowing of the left. So basically, his entire heart muscle was being supplied by a very small channel through the left main coronary artery. For Ron Rikino, a heart attack was inevitable. I have grown up, high school graduation, my wedding, my kids' births, thinking, gee, wouldn't it be nice if my father was here? And I'm not gonna have that happen to my kids. So two weeks before his 38th birthday, Ron went under the knife and had bypass surgery. Surgeons would use blood vessels harvested from other parts of the body and bypass Ron's blockages. One end of the vessel will be attached to the aorta, the heart's main artery, and the other beyond the blockage, creating a new pathway for blood flow. It's almost as if you had a highway 
five lane freeway and four of the lanes had construction going on. You built another 10 lane freeway just to the side of it that allow you to get off, go up in front of the construction and get back on. And that's what a bypass is. Bypass surgery is usually routine. Over 600,000 procedures are performed annually in the United States. But few are as complicated and dramatic as Ron's surgery would turn out to be. Ron's doctors had just begun surgery when they noticed his heart wasn't getting enough oxygen. We immediately heparinized with the EKG changes and started him on high dose nitro, but to our horror, the changes continued to grow worse. Ron was having a massive heart attack, probably triggered by his severe blockages and the stress of the surgery. Dr. Cohn manually pumped Ron's heart for more than five minutes while his partner attached Ron to the heart-lung machine. The heart-lung machine circulates the blood around, it adds oxygen, it takes carbon dioxide off, it warms the blood, it cools the blood, it does everything that the heart and or lungs would have to do. With the heart-lung machine now supporting his vital organs, doctors stopped Ron's heart. They then packed his heart in ice and injected it with special solutions to protect it from damage. We can keep the heart stop for three or four hours and have it come back again beating at the end of the operation. With the crisis over, and Ron's heart immobilized, Dr. Cohn was able to continue surgery. Vessels harvested from Ron's arm, leg, and chest were sewn to the coronary arteries using polypropylene sutures thinner than a human hair. In total, Dr. Cohn made four bypass grafts. After several hours of surgery, the doctors weaned Ron off of the heart-lung machine and his heart began beating on its own. Three years after his surgery, Ron's arteries are free from blockage. He's made lifestyle changes in diet and exercise and continues to monitor his cholesterol levels. All part of a daily regimen to keep his arteries open. Sit. There you go. I'm all or nothing. That's, that's just the way I am. I can't imagine not doing the right things to, to try to stay alive. It just, it wouldn't make any sense to me. Surgeons have been performing bypass surgery since the 1960s. The procedure became widely used when doctors were able to create a motion-free environment by stopping the heart using the heart-lung machine. This made surgery easy, but dangerous for the patient. Now surgeons have a safer alternative to stopping the heart. Here at Massachusetts General Hospital, doctors use the Cone Cardiac Stabilizer, developed by Ron's surgeon, Dr. William Cone. It allows surgeons to graft vessels to a beating heart. By holding just one segment of an artery motion-free and allowing the rest of the heart to continue its beating process, you can emulate that same sort of motion-free, blood-free field sort of microenvironment to allow the suturing to be carried out while still allowing the heart and lungs to maintain the support of the patient. Silicone elastic tape is fed beneath the coronary artery. This flat plastic instrument sits on the surface of the heart with the artery appearing through this rectangular window. The silicone tapes are pulled tight, cutting off blood flow to the small section of the artery. The graft can now be attached. So far, the cone cardiac stabilizer allows patients to recover faster with less incidence of infection. The risk of death associated with stopping the heart is also reported to be significantly decreased. Unfortunately for many people, the first indication of heart disease is heart attack. But risk factors are actually easy to identify. If you have high cholesterol or high blood pressure, if you smoke, are physically inactive, 
If you're overweight, have diabetes, or have a family history of heart disease, you may be at risk. Hi, I'm here for a cardiac stress test. My name is Kat Carney. Hi, Kat. Let's go ahead and get started on your blood work. Okay. Come on through. Is this going to hurt? No. Okay. <laughs> I oh used to goodness. weigh 240 pounds and have a predisposition for diabetes. That's enough reason to bring me in for a cardiac checkup. Pinch. Ow. Oh, okay, that wasn't feel. so bad. No. Oh, I see some blood flowing. One of the biggest risk factors for heart disease is high cholesterol. So they start by taking blood. You relax your fist. Okay. Once the blood work is done, I'm on to the treadmill for the cardiac stress test. So what is this test going to show? What we're trying to do is increase your heart rate and your blood pressure and determine whether or not the blood supply to your heart is adequate to keep up with that increased workload. Dr. Saul Cohen has me hooked up to an electrocardiogram, or EKG machine, that takes electrical impulse readings from 12 different areas of my heart. You're doing very well. Dr. Cohen increases the speed and incline to make my heart work harder. Heart rate's actually going up quite nicely and appropriately. Are you having any chest pains or pressure in your chest? No. How's the breathing? It's good. Great. Dr. Cohen intermittently checks my blood pressure. 110 over 70. We started uh, around 100 over 70, so your blood pressure's gone up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's going to keep going up, so don't panic over that. Okay. Your blood pressure is supposed to go up with increased exercise. Okay. Lack of oxygen to the heart caused by narrowed arteries is called ischemia. The pain from ischemia is called angina. If any part of my heart is ischemic, it will show up as an irregularity on the EKG reading. And just stay on board, and we're going to continue to take blood pressures. After nine minutes on the treadmill, Dr. Cohen would be able to see if I'm at risk for heart attack. Ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me uh, just show you a composite first of your electrocardiogram. Okay. And basically what we did during the stress test is measure 12 different views of your heart and your heart was functioning perfectly from every angle we looked at. Oh, good. Well, now, how does my blood work relate to my stress test? Well, that's a great question because your blood work indicates uh, risk factors, most important being cholesterol. Your cholesterol, is cholesterol levels above 200 are considered high. My total cholesterol is 167, which is good, but I need to look further. To determine my overall risk, I divide my total cholesterol of 167 by my total number of good cholesterol carriers, which is 66. That equals 2.5, which means that my ratio of good cholesterol to bad cholesterol is healthy. And that cholesterol HDL ratio places you at less than 25% of the average risk for your age. So these are the numbers that really everyone should know. By keeping up my regular exercise and watching my diet, I can help keep my cholesterol numbers low and my arteries free from blockages. It's 8 a.m. Nurses at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston prep Richard Fagan for surgery. In a recent stress test and subsequent angiogram, Richard's doctors found significant blockages in his left main coronary artery. Doctors believe the main cause was 50 years of smoking. You know, I asked the cardiologist about causes, what causes this? Why would I have this? Uh, is there any question that smoking was a they contributed to this. They both said that smoking was the cause of whatever my problems were. The nicotine in cigarette smoke causes the release of adrenaline, which constricts the blood vessels. This can lead to high blood pressure, damaging the inside walls of the artery, making it easier for cholesterol to build up. To unclog Richard's arteries, doctors will use angioplasty. 
Dr. Darren Walters cuts a small hole in the femoral artery in Richard's groin. This serves as a port. Through this port, Dr. Walters inserts a wire and establishes a pathway up to Richard's blocked coronary arteries. Usually a catheter with a deflated balloon at the tip is then guided along the wire up to the heart. The catheter enters here from above the heart. The balloon is then guided to the blockages in the coronary artery and inflated several times, pushing back the plaque, opening up the artery. Angioplasty is a fairly simple procedure and is performed nearly 700,000 times a year in the United States. It usually takes about 20 minutes. Richard has received a local anesthetic and will remain conscious during the procedure. Surgeon Stephen Osterley joins Dr. Walters to begin the procedure. Hold your breath, don't breathe. Throughout the surgery, Dr. Osterley injects contrast into Richard's heart. Doctors use these x-ray angiogram images to locate blockages and guide their work. Dr. Osterley discovers that Richard's blockages are so severe and complicated that traditional angioplasty alone won't be effective. This is pretty nasty disease beyond it, you can see that. Richard has severe blockages in this forked area of his left main coronary artery. There is also narrowing in this lower part of his artery. Before Dr. Osterley can use the traditional balloon here, he will first have to clear a pathway in the forked area using a more powerful tool. You can see it's pinched right here. It's actually pinched down here. Dr. Osterley will use an atherectomy catheter, a mechanical device 2.3 millimeters in diameter that shaves plaque off the inside of the artery wall. This is razor sharp. When I activate it, it rotates at about 1,500 RPM. We use this on about 1% of our patients, 2%. So you can see this is a little bit of an unusual case. We usually don't use this device. Dr. Osterley inserts the atherectomy catheter. He moves the device over the blockage 10 to 20 times, shaving away layers of plaque and removing most of it from the body. You can see after we've shaved both branches, we've got a nice channel in both ways where that used to be tightly narrowed. We're not done, but we're making progress. Dr. Osterley then guides the balloon-tipped catheter to the lower blockage. He inflates the balloon, pushing back the plaque, and inserts a stent to prop the artery open so it won't block off again. We're just kind of lining it up here, trying to make sure we know where, that we put it in the right place. Finally, Dr. Osterley moves back to the forked area and simultaneously inflates two balloons to push out the remaining plaque. This is called kissing balloons, and it's done so that the plaque from either side of the fork won't be pushed into the other. It's a little tricky because I'm not sure God meant for us to put two big balloons in like that, but we're, we're being very careful about it. After two and a half hours of surgery, normal blood flow has returned to Richard's heart. His arteries are completely open. God bless you. Take care. You're ready to go home. It's only been three short weeks since Richard's procedure, but already he's feeling much better. To keep his arteries open, Richard plans to join a gym and monitor his diet. And of course, he has quit smoking. When we are stressed, hormones like adrenaline and epinephrine flood the body, stimulating the heart to pump harder. We breathe faster, our blood vessels constrict, and our blood pressure escalates. This is called the stress response.
The stress response can be also called the fight or flight response. It prepares us for running or for fighting. But in today's society, we usually don't fight or run. Stress can lead to high blood pressure. Stress can lead to cardiac irregularities. Even heart attacks could come about due to, se due to severe stress. In 1970, Dr. Herbert Benson, then at Harvard Medical School, discovered that when we are exposed to long-term stress, the elevated levels of fight or flight-induced hormones can damage our arteries. This allows cholesterol to build up more easily and blood clots are more apt to form. Dr. Benson soon became interested in people who claimed they could control their blood pressure. Not with medication, but through meditation. I am peaceful and relaxed. We discovered that when people meditated, there was a distinct physiologic pattern that ensued. This was one of decreased metabolism, decreased heart rate, decreased blood pressure, decreased rate of breathing, all of which were opposite to the stress response. Dr. Benson calls this phenomenon the relaxation response. Here at Benson's Mind Body Institute's Cardiac Wellness Center, heart patients practice yoga and meditation to learn how to evoke the relaxation response and lower their blood pressure. The goal is for people to take the relaxation skills they learn here and use them to counteract stress in everyday situations. In randomized long-term studies, Hypertensive patients who learned stress management and relaxation response were able to significantly lower their blood pressure and cholesterol and keep them down over a three to five year period. And 80% of those patients were able to cut down on their medications. In our rapidly paced world, the level of stress seems to rise every day. Programs like those at Benzen's Mind Body Institute aim to help people break the stress cycle and reduce the risk for heart attack. The heart beats on average 100,000 times a day pumping nearly 2,000 gallons of blood through almost 60,000 miles of circulatory system, enough to encircle the Earth more than twice. And it all starts with an electrical pulse. I, I was a, a jogger. I used to do uh, 25 miles a week or so. I was conscious of my diet. And I always thought if you did those things, you wouldn't have to worry about your heart. On November 19, 1998, Mike and Dolores Ty boarded American Airlines Flight 11 from Boston to Los Angeles. Three hours into the flight, they discovered that heart attack can happen anywhere. The plane wasn't full, so there was uh, plenty of room, and we were sharing, uh, two of us were sharing three seats, so she wanted to put her feet on my lap, and uh, I didn't want them up there, so we were kind of fooling around. And uh, with that, uh, I went unconscious. All of a sudden, his, he just, his head slumped back and his arm flailed out into the aisle. So I got him down on the floor and I tried to feel for a pulse. I couldn't feel a pulse. I tried to hear if he was breathing. It did not look like he was breathing at all. Within seconds, the flight attendant and Dolores began CPR, but Mike was unresponsive. His heart's electrical system was malfunctioning. Each heartbeat starts with an impulse from the heart's own natural pacemaker, the sinoatrial node located in the right atrium. It sends out small electrical impulses that travel through the heart, causing it to beat at regular intervals. About 60 beats per minute at rest and up to 170 beats per minute during exercise. 
Mike's heart was racing at more than 300 beats per minute. His heart had gone into ventricular fibrillation, a condition where the main pumping chamber develops a chaotic and very fast rhythm. Within moments, Mike's heart became exhausted and stopped. He was in cardiac arrest, a condition that, according to the American Heart Association, happens to more than 350,000 people a year in the United States. The only treatment is really to uh, do CPR and to shock the heart through the chest wall back into a normal rhythm, the so-called defibrillation. And unless it's treated, uh, it, uh, it's fatal. Luckily for Mike, the plane had been equipped with an automatic external defibrillator, or AED, just eight days before his flight. Connect electrodes. The flight attendant attached the AED to Mike's chest, which sent an electrical shock to his heart. They put the pads on and they called to defibrillate, and it shocked him and it jolted him and he moved. And then the next thing was, okay, resume CPR. And this happened three times. And finally, the fourth time, they did it, and I came around. The plane made an emergency landing in Denver, where medical technicians rushed Mike to a local hospital. I wasn't aware of where I was, but I was alert and I was alive. And without the defibrillator, uh, I would never have made it. In the past few years, these portable devices have been popping up in many public places like casinos and health clubs. Bystanders who happen to be the two nurses begin CPR. To learn how to use the AED, I took a class with Boston Emergency Medical Technician George Murphy at FitCore Health Club. With a simple four-hour course, we're going to teach you adult CPR, or adult choking, and how to use the defibrillator. Okay, Kat, Jennifer's going to go ahead and show you how, the, how we do a minute's worth of CPR, and I'll talk you through it. First thing she's going to do is establish unresponsiveness, look, listen, and feel for three to five seconds to see if they're breathing. Jennifer alternately compresses the victim's chest and breathes for the victim until the defibrillator arrives. Now we'll assume that you've arrived with the AED, so the first thing you're going to do is turn it on. Okay, I'm going to do this? Yeah, just go ahead and turn it on. Once you turn it on, it begins to tell you what to do. Connect electrodes. Okay, so this one goes here like yep. this? There are easy diagrams that show you how to use the machine. And I would assume I'd have to work fairly quickly with this. With each minute that passes during cardiac arrest, the chance of death increases by 7 to 10%. Stand clear. It's found a shockable rhythm, so the person should be defibrillated. The AED will only send a shock if it detects a fast, chaotic heartbeat or no heartbeat at all. Once you're sure nobody's touching, you hit the button. And now the person's been defibrillated. Oh. Using the AED is extremely easy. Just follow the voice prompts, and the machine tells you what to do. I'm very active. I work every day. This big sculpture that I do is, is, uh, takes a lot of energy. Nancy Schoen is a sculptor best known for her Make Way for Duckling sculpture on the Boston Common. But in 1996, Nancy noticed that her energy levels were dropping. I'd be standing at the checkout counter and I'd feel sort of dizzy because I was going to faint. After several trips to the doctor, Nancy was finally diagnosed with arrhythmia, an irregularity in the force or rhythm of her heartbeat. Apparently my heart at night was at 29 beats per minute. <laughs> and I said to my doctor, is my heart gonna stop? I mean, I was really scared. Nancy's heart was beating too slowly, and it was unable to supply enough oxygen to the rest of her body. Arrhythmia is an electrical disorder. Mild arrhythmia is very common. One in five healthy adults experience arrhythmia in any given day. But your risk of severe arrhythmia increases if you've had chronic lung disease, if you've had a heart attack, or in Nancy's case, as you age. 
To return her heart to a normal rhythm, doctors recommended a pacemaker, an electronic device that would regulate her heart's electrical system. It's a fairly simple procedure that's done over 100,000 times each year in the United States. I was awake through the entire procedure. It was really painless. And it was sort of exciting <laughs> to think that I was going to have a machine inside me. Pacemakers are implanted underneath the skin in the abdomen or under the right shoulder. Wires or leads travel through large blood vessels from the pacemaker to the heart. Through these leads, Nancy's pacemaker monitors her heart rhythm. When Nancy's heart skips a signal, her pacemaker fires an electrical impulse to replace it. I'm just, I'm very lucky because this is something that could be fixed and it was fixed rather easily. And uh, the battery is now, I think, about five years old. Nancy goes to the New England Medical Center twice a year for a checkup. I'm going to turn you over to Melanie. You know the routine. She's going to check the pacemaker okay. and I'll review everything with her a little bit later. This computer uses radio waves to communicate with Nancy's pacemaker. It reads the heart's activity over the past six months. It can then make adjustments, increasing or decreasing the pace of her heart, depending on her needs. And your heart rate is increasing with activity appropriately. So everything looks great. Good. That's wonderful. Yeah. Nancy can also check her pacemaker from home once a month over the phone. At 9 o'clock on Thursday, every fourth Thursday morning, I get a telephone call. And I wet my wrists and put on some little bracelets. And I'm hooked into the New England Medical Center. The computer at the hospital communicates with Nancy's pacemaker through the phone. The whole process takes less than five minutes. That's it. OK, thank you so much for helping me. Thanks to the pacemaker, Nancy has resumed a more energetic life. I, it, it's sort of a miracle because if this had been another time, um, I would have been an invalid or possibly I would not be here to tell this story. So it's quite, it's a wonderful mechanism, uh, this pacemaker. I love it. <laughs>after bypass surgery, 41-year-old Ron Ricchino is obsessive about his heart health. He has made sweeping lifestyle changes that have helped to lower his cholesterol from 340 to a healthy 130. Ron starts each day with a handful of medications, including a statin, a class of drug that blocks cholesterol production in the body, mostly in the liver. The statin lowers his cholesterol by about 60 points. Ron has also taken up running. I run about two and a half miles, uh, minimum five days a week. I try to do it every day. Only about 22% of Americans get enough exercise to achieve heart health. 20 to 60 minutes of vigorous exercise three to five times a week makes the heart a more efficient pump. Exercise also helps lower cholesterol levels, blood pressure, and can help prevent heart rhythm disorders. For someone who has already had a heart attack like Ron, exercise can reduce the risk of future coronary incidents by as much as 90%. But Ron's lifestyle changes don't end here because he knows his entire family is at risk. So far, Ron's 15-year-old son, Greg, has checked out fine. But 13-year-old Tracy has high cholesterol, just like her dad. So the Rakino family has taken another step. They've changed their diet. And it all starts at the supermarket. Mm -hmm. Do some shopping? OK. I'm taking a trip to the local market with Ron's wife, Carol, to see how she fights the cholesterol battle. So all of this is out. Well, we do eat this one. Carol's goal is to reduce the amount of fat in her family's diet. When we read labels, if you look at the total number of calories and the calories from fat, 
quick rule of thumb is that you don't want your calories from fat to be more than 30% of your diet. With each item, Carol reads the label and does a quick calculation. If the fat calories are more than a third of the total calories, then the fat content for her family is too high. So now, do you do that arithmetic with every product you pick up? Absolutely. So this is the one we're going with. That's the one. This is soy. We use this instead of ground beef. It's important for everyone to watch their total fat intake. But what increases cholesterol levels most are saturated fats. The saturated fat goal is, is pretty intense. Um, Ron's target for a day is 12 grams of saturated fat, which um, if, if you're a label reader, um, you'll see that it could happen pretty quickly. We don't do whole eggs, we do egg whites. Um, the cheeses, the fat-free variety like the, the mozzarella. Doctors recommend no more than 20 grams of saturated fat a day. But in the United States, each day we're consuming nearly 50 grams and our arteries are becoming clogged. We can make a nice Caesar the Rikino diet is high in grains, fruits, and vegetables. Carol has cut out most meats using low-fat or no-fat substitutes. Everything that you would have normally, I just modify the ingredients. Everybody likes it. If I don't tell them that that's what it was made with, they never know the difference. No one suspects. The Rikino lasagna recipe has been specifically modified, so there's almost no fat in it. Tracy uses fat-free soy instead of beef. She mixes the soy with saturated fat-free tomato sauce. And finally, she layers it with low-fat cottage cheese instead of ricotta and non-fat Parmesan. Go. Oh wow, looks great. <laughs> On a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, it's, life is good. Why would we want to just kind of keep it that way? I'm at a point where any blockages that I might have or anything it should be reducing because of uh, being able to keep my cholesterol so low. It's not fun sometimes, but I'm alive, and and you know it's worth the sacrifice. <laughs> Here, thousands of people with coronary artery disease join the ranks of the so-called no-option patient. They have blockages so severe that they cannot be treated by medications, angioplasty, or even bypass surgery. Hope for these patients lies in research aimed at stimulating the heart to grow new vessels. When our hearts experience angina, pain from lack of oxygen, the body naturally releases chemicals that stimulate new vessel growth. Good. But some yeah. people don't grow these vessels well or don't grow them at all. For these patients, a controversial procedure may help. It's called transmyocardial revascularization, or TMR. Here, a high-energy laser blasts holes or channels into the heart muscle. The laser burns a one millimeter wide channel through the left ventricle 20 to 40 times. It is not known exactly how TMR works, but the leading theory is that this minor damage to the heart triggers a response that stimulates new vessel growth. A TMR, transmyocardial revascularization, is uh, a method by which the surgeon tries to trick the heart into growing new blood vessels thinking is that that causes an inflammatory response. It causes the heart to release these mediators, these circulating compounds that cause new blood vessels to grow. In clinical studies, patients gain, on average, a 20% improvement in blood flow and 72% experienced significantly less pain. Dr. Michael Simons of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center is trying to stimulate the body to grow new vessels in a different way with genetically engineered proteins. As we age, our bodies no longer produce the protein that stimulates blood vessel growth. Today, researchers can grow the protein in the laboratory and inject it directly into the heart to spur new blood vessel growth. These new vessels bypass the arterial blockages. So far, only a handful of studies have been done on humans, but the data looks encouraging. 
The yellow shows normal blood flow. The darker areas represent parts of the heart that were not getting adequate blood flow. Just two months after being injected, these parts of the heart are now receiving sufficient blood flow. What you can see in yellow is a normal blood flow in the heart. The parts of the heart that don't get adequate flow here appear as sort of purple. Two months later, this part of the heart is now looking absolutely normal. So is this. For now, gene therapy and TMR remain controversial therapies. But as blood vessel regeneration becomes better understood, scientists hope that the term no option patient will become obsolete. Sore to touch? Yeah. What kind of a soreness is it? More like, uh, more like an ache. Heart sick, heartache, heartbreak. The stuff that love songs are made of. But did you ever consider that a broken heart might increase your chances of heart disease? Would you like to hear your heart murmur? <laughs> What's it sound like? It's like a wind blowing. As a cardiologist, I would say, most of the patients I see who actually have a heart attack have a broken heart, socially, emotionally, spiritually, somehow. Sound like a hurricane. Uh -huh. Dr. Harvey Zarin encourages patients to open their hearts and get in touch with their feelings. I ask patients with whom they share their feelings as a lead-in when people first come to the cardiac care unit because I know if they're not sharing their feelings, if their heart is in fact closed, they're going to be more prone to have a second event. So I invite us to allow our hands to reach out and feel this physical connection that we make. This is Heal Your Heart, an unusual cardiac rehabilitation program that opened at Union Hospital in Lynn, Massachusetts in 1992. Here, heart patients learn to modify their diet, follow an exercise regimen, and heal their emotionally sick heart. It's a struggle. I didn't feel well today. I used to always stuff my feelings. I don't think there's anybody sitting here that hasn't helped me. It's clear that when people begin to share love and compassion and open up their feelings, you can watch and measure their heart rate slow, their blood pressure drops, their skin looks less pale because they're not closing up all their little blood vessels, and the heart is eased. It's literally eased. I'm getting a good stretch and then looking up, chin up, eyes up, and then slowly exhale it down. Huh. The philosophy of Heal Your Heart is simple. Feelings of isolation and loneliness predispose us to heart disease. The program is modeled on research showing that heart disease can be reversed through emotional recovery, as well as lifestyle changes like improved diet and exercise. People may forget what you say, and they may forget what you do but they will always remember how you make them feel. I don't know where I'd be without this group. Uh, I've had a heart attack in 82, a triple bypass in 94. Try to handle all that, and you come here and you're able to handle it. All I could think of was that I was gonna die. I think that was my biggest fear, was that I was gonna die. And coming here helped me face that. You know, we're all going to die sometime, you know, and we have some control over that. Once the crying comes out, these people become so much more comfortable as human beings. They become excited, they become energized, a lot of their depression drops away, their health clearly improves, they're in the hospital less, they have less recurrent heart attacks, they have much less in the way of ongoing disease. It's quite striking and quite amazing to watch. The most important thing to remember about heart attack is you don't want to have one. Prevention is the key. Know your risk factors and take the steps to reduce cholesterol and stress. Exercise more and find the diet that's right for you. Quit smoking and learn your family history about heart disease. As former Surgeon General C. Everett Koop once said, there's no prescription more valuable than knowledge. I'm Kat Carney. Stay healthy.